There's no better way to summarize Lost Odyssey's thematic aim than with this quote from the game's composer, renowned Final Fantasy legend Nobuo Uematsu. When I was composing the main theme, I often imagined what it would be like to live for a thousand years. It must be so intolerable and painful seeing your families, lovers, and friends dying while you remain living. This feeling drove me to write the theme in a minor key. Perhaps above anything else Lost Odyssey sets out to do, it's this examination of what eternal life might be like that I found to be the most compelling idea. When framing this in the form of a question, it lays the groundwork for a thought experiment that I find really intriguing. Each of us is born with a drive to survive, to live long, fruitful lives, and to pursue as much happiness as we can. However, if one really could live forever, even while those around you grow old and die, if you could really find yourself outlasting a world that constantly changes and suffer the losses that inevitably come alongside those difficult changes, how fulfilling would such a life really be? At what point would a person become fatigued with the world? Would the memories you make with those that pass on increase your happiness? Or would the constant loss of loved ones lead to a path of endless sorrow? Lost Odyssey explores this proposition in beautiful, nuanced ways through the many short stories told in its thousand years of dreams. And while the main plot doesn't focus as much attention on this theme as I would have liked, it still provides a perspective not often featured in games like this. Nevertheless, it has a strong sense of style and a solid foundation, and for many players, measures up to the great classics of the genre. But before we get into that, let's turn back time a bit. Around the turn of the century, Squaresoft was undergoing some big internal changes. They were in negotiations for a merger with rival company Enix, were broadening the scope of their production capability by founding a movie studio and producing a feature-length film, and were transitioning their game development workflow to accommodate brand new hardware with the PlayStation 2. At this time, Final Fantasy series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi was the executive vice president at Square and was well-respected within the company's culture for his role in Final Fantasy's mainstream success throughout the 90s. However, his business philosophy wasn't supported by everyone. Newly appointed CFO Yoichi Wada, in particular, became Sakaguchi's largest source of opposition internally, and their disagreements came to a head when the spirits within bombed at the box office and lost the company tens of millions of dollars. Anticipating that the shareholders would ultimately side with Wada, who became the president of Square shortly thereafter, Sakaguchi had already laid down his plans to walk away and start his own independent studio. In early 2001, before the release of Spirits Within, he had already registered a trademark for Mistwalker and secured its domain name. Though he stayed on at Square in an executive producer role for Final Fantasy XI and XII, he was also making preparations to go his own way. And in 2003, he left the company which had served as his home for 20 years and upon which he had founded his name and legacy to begin a new phase of his career as an independent game maker. What many people don't realize is that Mistwalker, until recently, didn't have the staff or resources to operate as a true development studio. For most of its operation, the company has primarily focused on the story, concept art, and music elements of their games, while outsourcing all other development to third-party companies such as Feel Plus, Artune, and their parent company, AQ Interactive. Sakaguchi still held a supervisory role during the production of games like Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey, but the bulk of the development of those games was actually handled by Artoon and Feel Plus, respectively. In an interview with Gamasutra, Lost Odyssey's executive producer, Rei Nakazato, discussed Mistwalker and Sakaguchi's level of involvement by stating that it was very close when we were starting up the project. There was a Mistwalker office, which is a really small company, so it's basically just Sakaguchi. It's like the Sakaguchi office. It's like three or four people in that office. So we rented a big space next to Mistwalker for about 10 people. At the beginning of the project, we sent those 10 people in next to Sakaguchi's office and did initial work. He was writing the story while this was happening. Now that things are going well, he's more hands-off. We probably see him twice a month. He lives in Hawaii, so he spends half his time in Japan and half in Hawaii. When he's in Hawaii, he writes a lot. 
when he's in Japan, he does more producer-oriented stuff. He's quite involved, and I think he's coming in again now that the game's playable. He'll probably come up with a lot more comments. We try to satisfy him as much as possible. That will take place over the next few months. Considering that Sakaguchi no longer had access to Square's talented staff or resources, he relied on collaborations with other well-known artists and creators in Japan. One of these was with famed manga artist Takihiko Inoue, who is best known for his basketball manga Slam Dunk and samurai series Vagabond. When looking at the art from Vagabond in particular, you can immediately see how his unique style was carried over to Lost Odyssey, and his work certainly provided a stellar look and feel you don't typically see in JRPGs. In addition to his original character designs, Final Fantasy IX art director Hideo Minaba, alongside Christian Lorenz Schurer, who also worked on Final Fantasy IX, lent their talents to the architectural and clothing designs, and again, I think those influences are pretty apparent. Beyond these talented artists, Sakaguchi also turned to best-selling author Kiyoshi Shigematsu to write The Thousand Years of Dreams, and of course, Nobuo Uematsu to compose the music. But I'll go into more depth on their roles a little later. It's just impressive to stand back at the outset of analyzing Lost Odyssey and appreciate the wealth of talent that was assembled for this project. Perhaps it would be blasphemous to equate it to that of Chrono Trigger's Dream Team, but these guys were no joke either. On the other hand, Sakaguchi's choice to publish Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey as Xbox 360 exclusives, rather than releasing them on PlayStation 3, the platform of choice for most of his longtime fans, is something that has confused a lot of players. One would think that such an unconventional choice was driven by solid market research or insider information on industry trends, but the truth is, it might have been motivated by nothing more than a personal beef with Ken Kutaragi, former CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America. In the June 2007 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly, Sakaguchi was quoted as saying, The PS3's architecture is tricky, and I don't like Ken Kutaragi. While the PlayStation 3 was notoriously difficult to work with for third-party developers, Microsoft had absolutely no footing with their market share in Japan, so the second part of that statement feels like it held more weight in Sakaguchi's decision to skip the PS3. In this Polygon article, detailing the legacy of Kutaragi in the games industry, it says the following. For years, colleagues have described Kutaragi with a mix of admiration and fear, commonly referring to him as Crazy Ken and telling stories about his tirades at work. Talk to people who knew him in the Sony days, and they'll often describe him as moody, stubborn, and an extreme micromanager. And nearly everyone who worked closely with him in those days seems to have stories of his abrasive approach. Mistwalker founder Hironobu Sakaguchi says Kutoragi blew up at him in a discussion in the mid-2000s, noting that he plans to take the details of that conversation to his grave. Whatever happened between them, it seems to have been bad enough for Sakaguchi to risk taking a hit to Lost Odyssey's selling power in Japan, knowing full well that Microsoft's marketing strategy wasn't sufficient. Microsoft has to change its marketing strategy in Japan. There are a lot of excellent games on the 360, far better games than what's on the Wii or PS3, but not a lot of people in Japan have a clear idea of what games like Gears of War are all about. Just look at the Windows Vista commercial, it's terrible. That being said, he seemed to really believe in the Xbox 360 and had a lot of trust with some of the higher-ups at Xbox Japan, whom he had worked with in the past at Square. When I started out with Mistwalker, I decided to create these two titles, and I was talking to Akira Toriyama, Takehiko Inoue, and also Kiyoshi Shigematsu, and we were preparing, but I had nobody in mind about who to go with on the hardware side of things. And of course, the projects needed funding, and obviously, a publisher. And at around this time, I was talking to Maruyama and also Kawai. And Mr. Maruyama was the one I worked with when I was still working at Square. And at that time, Mr. Maruyama was working on US sales of Final Fantasy. So I had a very strong trust with Mr. Maruyama, and also Mr. Kawai was the one who was working on Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and IX, so I really trusted these two, and that's why I chose to go with Microsoft. While Lost Odyssey started its initial development internally at Microsoft, it didn't get off to a very smooth start, according to Rei Nakazato. Lost Odyssey was once an internal project that was done by my staff anyway, but it wasn't going well. 
One of the reasons it wasn't going well was because it was an internal project and Microsoft's culture and systems made it harder. We couldn't go smoothly. That's when we decided to make our team an independent studio, and I asked Mr. Nakayama to found the company. I then moved several Microsoft people into that studio and also hired a good number of people into that studio. I joined that company a little later, after I finished 99 Nights. When asked why Microsoft's systems and culture made development difficult, he responded by saying, One thing is cost. Man month cost is very high. Not salaries, but being a Microsoft employee is expensive. We have a fixed amount of budget, and with Microsoft's man month cost, we can only do so much. But if we move the company, per person per month cost goes down, so we can do more. So that's one thing. Recruiting was another problem. We had to recruit a lot of people, and Microsoft as a company has a very high bar to hire people in. The person has to be generally superior in all areas, but game specialists in general are often great in one area and not so great in others. It was very hard to meet all the hiring criteria that Microsoft had, so it was hard to hire people. Stuff like that. Interestingly enough, much of the staff he ended up bringing on were ex-Nautilus developers, guys who worked on games like Kodelka and Shadow Hearts. These were devs with lots of experience in the genre, and according to Nakasato, this was a big reason why getting his team unified on the design philosophy was a smooth experience. The game system itself is a traditional JRPG, so we had a lot of people who had a lot of experience with this, and we didn't have to worry. There are so many people used to developing traditional JRPGs that from the perspective of game design, I don't think there was a problem. That being said, the development process was far from smooth sailing. Nakasato went on to note that having a large staff so early on, before Xbox 360 development kits were available, actually ended up costing the team a lot of time and effort. I think perhaps we started too early in the project and ended up having too many people involved at too early a stage. Game designers had to start the design before they even had the hardware, so a lot of what they did had to start off with trying to imagine what things might be in the future. So we had to redo a lot of those things. Working with Unreal Engine 3 on next-gen hardware also proved difficult for Fuel Plus. While it was cutting edge at the time, it was also designed in a way that felt foreign to how many of the team members were used to building games. It took some time and growing pains for them to become united in how they should go about using Unreal Engine more efficiently. In Japan, those who are used to JRPG engines have a different style. Both are inconsistent and incompatible. If we knew that earlier, we could have had a consensus that we should use Unreal 3's method, but we just applied our old philosophy. According to Nakasato, that integration didn't end up going so well. I think we were able to get really highly skilled people together, but it was a new team, a new platform, and a new middleware. Because of this, I think it was quite a challenging project. I don't think that could have been resolved, but we've done it once, so if we were to do it again, we could do it much more smoothly and be more productive. Despite all this difficulty behind the scenes, Lost Odyssey doesn't show many rough edges for it. The gameplay experience is so smooth that I wouldn't have guessed that the devs struggled so much with the hardware. I'll get into the mechanics later, but it was interesting to me, as a longtime fan of Sakaguchi, that the story was where I ended up having the majority of my personal criticisms. That being said, it's difficult to parse who exactly bears the responsibility for some of its conceptual and presentational missteps. While Sakaguchi is credited as the scenario writer, he's not credited for writing the script, and obviously did not direct the game. He did, however, serve in a supervisory role, with Nakazato indicating that he was quite involved in giving feedback. The team also seemed to make a concerted effort to please him. Without being able to talk to these men face to face, it's impossible to know exactly how the process was handled, but we do at least have some good quotes from Sakaguchi that establish his personal goals and aspirations for how he wanted the story to land with players. And I think that's the best place to start in analyzing what we ultimately ended up getting. My biggest desire with Lost Odyssey was to make an innovative game that would incite players' emotions. So I took a less risky way and made a traditional style game, but put a lot of effort into the stories in the game. My wish is that players will be absorbed into the conflicts and moral dilemmas in Lost Odyssey. I'm most happy when I see a tear in the eye of someone playing Lost Odyssey. I wish for people to not play the game without paying attention to the story and the difficult situations they will face.
The aim for Lost Odyssey was to create an emotional experience for players, so we believe the traditional RPG gameplay will work best for this game and its fans. These systems make the game more interactive while not taking away from our focus, which is the story of Lost Odyssey. This game is appealing to players' emotions even further. It has received a reputation as the very first game that made me have tears in my eyes from Japanese players. I was most pleased by that comment. My overall target for the game is I want players to identify with the characters' attitudes of trying to be kind to others while embracing many conflicts and depressions in themselves, rather than leaving them with a cold and vacant feeling. It was the same when I created Blue Dragon. In each of these quotes, Sakaguchi continually emphasizes that the team's focus was to create an emotional experience, to really center their attention on the story. For this reason, I'll be placing a larger emphasis on breaking down the game's narrative, since many of its systems and mechanics, while all really sound, are mostly derivative of other RPGs. For the most part, that's a good thing, and I'll still take some time to go over them because there are some pretty unique ideas here, but the story is where this game really sets itself apart. I'll be discussing the story without spoilers first, but we'll have to dig into spoiler territory in sharing a few examples. I'll make sure to give a clear warning beforehand, however, so no need to worry if you haven't played the game. I want to start by talking about the Thousand Years of Dreams that I referenced in the introduction of the video. To briefly summarize, the Thousand Years of Dreams are a sequence of memories that took place in the main protagonist's life, events that he has forgotten about but is slowly recalling as you journey through the game world and interact with certain people and objects. Because this is a JRPG, Kaim is, of course, an amnesiac. This trope is well beyond commonplace for the genre, it's almost become a part of its core identity at this point. However, Lost Odyssey does something with it that makes the device a little more interesting than what you typically see in JRPGs. As it's structured, the process of recovering these memories, which play out as text interludes that resemble Japanese sound novel games, becomes one of the most enjoyable aspects of the entire experience. Each of these sequences was written by award-winning Japanese novelist Kiyoshi Shigematsu, a contemporary writer and one of the best-selling authors in Japan. To say that it shows would be an incredible understatement. Every one of these short stories is thoughtful and emotionally impactful, remaining tightly woven with the game's central theme of exploring the burdens of immortality. As I read these dreams, it became clear to me that Shigematsu is an experienced storyteller with a strong grasp on his craft, keeping his prose concise and well-paced while managing to be as expressive as is necessary for heart-rending scenes such as these. Sakaguchi described it this way. The reason I've used Kiyoshi Shigematsu as part of this project is because we don't see enough emotion in video games yet, whether to do with family or some other emotional elements, something that brings tears to your eyes. The main element in these games is often fighting or whatever, but I want these emotional elements. I think the main character, who has been living for a thousand years and can't die, he has a thousand years of memories and that creates a lot of emotional moments. It was these short stories from Shigematsu that helped convince Jay Rubin, one of the most respected Japanese literary translators in the world, to work on the project despite being adamantly opposed to the violence depicted in most big-budget video games. To say that it's out of the ordinary for game developers to seek the expertise of a scholar of Rubin's caliber is putting it lightly, and he was equally baffled by the opportunity. I thought there was no way in hell I was going to add to the world's supply of senseless violence, but I agreed to at least have a look at the material. I was shocked to find that both pieces carried a strong message that violence is a terrible human failing and that the taking of life deserves only punishment. The strong moral core opposed to violence and the vivid imagery with which Shigematsu brought home this lesson for his young readers convinced me that I should sell out immediately. No, seriously, I wouldn't have translated a bunch of blood and gut slice em ups, but it certainly didn't hurt that they were willing to pay well for these fundamentally wholesome didactic pieces. I can honestly say that the Thousand Years of Dreams, for me, was the strongest storytelling element in the entire game. These stories, while taking place at different times throughout Kaim's life, 
remain thematically tied to the game's exploration of what immortality might actually be like, making each dream feel relevant and clear as to its purpose while allowing each of them to stand on their own. Ultimately, though, these dreams could be viewed as optional content to the main game, seeing as they're entirely skippable. You don't have to read them to understand the story of Lost Odyssey, but I'd argue that you do have to read them to understand its message. Because while The Thousand Years of Dreams makes a concerted effort to pose and reflect on the game's thematic question, the main story doesn't make the same kind of effort to answer it. That's about as much as I can say without using specific examples, so let this serve as your official warning that I'll be moving into spoilers now. If you'd like to skip ahead, I've put a time code on screen for you. Let's take a look at some of the passages from these short stories to demonstrate what I mean. In the third dream sequence, titled White Flowers, this part really stands out to me. At this stage of his life, Kaim had settled down and married a mortal woman, and with her had born a child. After an earthquake, he loses them both, and this is the section that follows. Kaim could never say to his daughter, You go first to heaven and wait for me. I'll be there before long. Nor would he ever know the joy of reunion with his loved ones. To live for a thousand years meant bearing the pain of a thousand years of partings. In the ninth dream, titled The Talkative Mercenary, Kaim is working as a warrior for hire. On the eve of a great battle, one which most of the men understand they will not survive, a young man begins to panic. After helping him defect and run away in the night, Kaim is confronted with the following question. What about you? You want to live too, don't you? You should run away with me. You don't want to die, do you? Want to live? No. Kaim had no great desire to live. He lives because there's nothing else he can do. He lives because he has to. Toma is far too young, his own burden of life far too fragile for him to know the pain of such a life. In the 11th dream, titled Letters from a Weakling, Kaim is horrified to find out that a woman he once loved, who ended up marrying a friend of his, was driven to suicide by the terrible racism she was forced to endure from her husband's family. As Kaim confronts his former friend, beating him over and over again for not protecting her, he comes to realize that he himself had neglected her calls for help. Despite being strong in many areas, he ultimately showed the same weakness as his friend, and upon visiting their graves many years later, recalls his feelings during that time. Every now and then, Kaim remembers Alex and Mina as he proceeds on his endlessly long journey. When he thinks back on what he himself was like in those days, wanting only to be strong in all things, the memory is a bitter one. If only he had been the person he is today, the present-day Kaim would not have rejected such human weakness. Now he would accept the fact, sometimes with a pained smile, sometimes with genuine heartbreak, that everyone is weak. If only he could begin his journey again, Mina might not have to die. But this is no more than a hopeless dream. He meets them only once, and they are gone forever. The mortals, the humans, the ones without eternal life. This is what makes them all the more dear to him. This is what makes his breast burn for them. Just in reading these excerpts, you can see what Sakaguchi was talking about in wanting to evoke powerful emotions from the player, and the Thousand Years of Dreams absolutely delivers on that promise. Each one displays refined storytelling that explores a unique premise with incredible depth. The main plot, however, isn't as focused on this motif. During the course of the story, it's revealed that Kaim, along with four other immortals, came to the mortal realm as observers from a parallel universe. They'd been sent to investigate a link between the worlds, one which was theorized to be causing the destabilization of the immortal's homeworld. Gongora, one of the five who was sent, describes this in his journal. Our pure and tarnished world was being warped and distorted by some unknown force, not unlike a virus distorting a living being. It's revealed that the energy that was distorting their world was actually human emotion. Apparently, in their own world, they're devoid of emotion, and when they entered the human world, the memories of their former lives were erased. However, they couldn't die like other humans. This isn't the same kind of immortality that the elves have in Lord of the Rings, either. While Kaim and the others don't appear to age, or to be more accurate, just age very, very slowly, they also can't be killed. Due to some differences in the space-time continuum or something, one year in their world is equivalent to a thousand years in the human world. 
During this thousand years, Gongora rediscovers their purpose, but becomes corrupted by the emotions he's now able to feel. He develops a lust for power and control, clinging to his immortal life, and decides he's going to stay and rule over all humanity. Knowing the others would resist him, he erases their memories again and uses them for his own schemes, gathering the magic energy needed to destroy the portal that connects the worlds. At the beginning of the game, Kaim is working for Gongora, but throughout the story, as he meets the other immortal characters, they collectively regain their memories and set out to stop his quest to rule the world. In the midst of this, we see Gongora engaging in political plots to put himself in advantageous positions, but it's all fairly standard fantasy fare. What ended up giving me pause, though, was how the game concluded. After reading all these dreams, which continually pointed to what a burden eternal life is, and given how Gongora's desire to cling to such a life is condemned, I found it strange that in the end, Ming, Kaim, and Sarah all decided to stay in the human world themselves. In this scene, where the immortals meet up after their thousand years, knowing it's time to go home, they're shocked when Gongora announces his intention to stay. It's unthinkable to them, and they tell him there's no way their superiors on the other side will allow it. They seem eager to return to their homeworld, which makes sense, wanting some form of rest from such long lives filled with the loss of loved ones. In the end, however, Ming ends up falling in love and marrying Jansen, one of the most unconvincing romances I've ever seen depicted on screen, and Kaim and Sarah decide to stay and raise their grandchildren. Given the inevitable conclusion of these scenarios, in which Jansen and the children will grow old and die, the pain of which is something the immortals have lived through countless times, I was confused that the game seemed to play this off as some kind of undisputed happy ending. It's like everything we learned about during Kaim's thousand-year experience plays no role in this decision, and he ends up clutching to his life just like Gongora did, sans the plot to rule the world, of course. Ultimately, the immortals' emotions get the better of them, the very same emotions that were apparently corrupting their world, and it feels like a conclusion that in many ways is at odds with the thread woven in the Thousand Years of Dreams. This world of mortals is against the very nature of the immortal beings, and their thousand years of loss and heartache, emotions they were never meant to feel, was a constant reminder of that. Yet, when all is said and done, they don't seem to accept this. On the contrary, Sarah reflects on the fact that human emotions are what led to her ability to love Kaim in the first place, suggesting that life with emotion, even though it comes with terrible grief, is still preferable to life without it. Perhaps this is best articulated by the famous expression, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." It could also be said that while Kaim's mindset about his thousand years might have been more cynical at one point, that he learns to appreciate the time he had with loved ones despite being forced to accept permanent separation from them. It could be argued that, during the course of the game's events, he softened a bit on this, being given the chance to reunite with his daughter, if only briefly, before her death, which led him to feel responsible for his grandchildren's care. It could also be said that reuniting with Sarah played some role in his change of mindset, and that the idea that an immortal life is filled only with heartache and loss is short-sighted, since it would also be filled with many moments of genuine happiness. I think this could have been a fine conclusion for the story to settle into, but it doesn't spend the time required to show this change occurring within Kaim. We don't get any scenes where we see his outlook on his immortality changing, where he reflects on the pain he suffered in the dreams, but is convinced those experiences are only one side of the coin, so to speak. There's no time in the main story dedicated to this kind of philosophical realization or epiphany, we don't have moments where the characters discuss this with one another, where they share their own unique experiences and perspectives on their immortality, and whether they've concluded that an immortal life is worth the fatigue and dejection that comes with it. Essentially, whether the good parts outweigh or justify living with such terrible losses for eternity. Instead, what you get are a lot of scenes like this. Is it true the Kents have requested a truce? Indeed, we heard that enough men were committed to cover the Wall Highlands and that most of the Ken force were eliminated. This war was started by them, it's only right they withdraw. There are also those who long to restore a powerful monarchy. Regardless of what your highness may desire, our country struggles with two political forces, the past 
and the present. The authorities in our military have voted unanimously to seize Ura as a preventative measure. You plan to start a war? The White Boa is already being converted into a battle flagship, and we've begun assembling troops and arms. This action is for the sake of the entire world. As you can see, it has been refitted with weapons. Do you understand what this means? Numara, like Kent before it, is bearing its aggressive fangs at our country. It is increasingly likely that our three countries, Gotsa, Ura, and Numara, will go to war. The purpose of this meeting is to find a way to avoid that. I want very much to hear what Queen Ming has to say on this subject. In other words, I don't feel this ending is earned. Instead, the story focuses the majority of its attention on stopping Gongora's plot to rule the world, which I find to be the least interesting aspect of Lost Odyssey's premise, the potential of which is tragically untapped by the time the ending credits roll. In the end, I remain unconvinced that eternal life would become anything less than a prison for the person experiencing it, a repetitive, unending cycle that would be less and less fulfilling as time went on. I would have liked to see the game dive more into that philosophical question with its main plot, perhaps even offering a strong counter-perspective to my own. Perhaps it can be said that Kaim just hadn't reached that point even after his harrowing thousand-year experience. In the end, he seems to have found the spark needed to stick around for a second millennium. But I guess I just failed to see how the events of the game would have provided that spark. Personally, I think a message of acceptance, that all things must eventually come to their end, and that death is the natural course of life, would have made for a more relevant and moving conclusion. In addition to this, the game's presentation is often clunky. Cutscene direction is stilted and stiff, and while the actors seem to have fine talent, the voice direction falls flat. Damn, they must be planning to invade Ura. The tone is inconsistent as well. While the Thousand Years of Dreams really captures that raw emotion and power that Sakaguchi suggested he was going for, the main story seems to be committed to undermining that tone with bad dialogue, awkward performances, cringe-inducing romance, and utterly cartoonish villains. And with its power, I shall control the world! <laughs> I shall lock your memories away for all eternity! Displaying the kind of callow sensibilities one would expect to see in the most cliché shounen anime, rather than a story that was designed to evoke deep emotion from its players. I'm also a strong believer in the philosophy that heroes are only as good as their villains, and in this case, the villains are incredibly weak. In every one of these aspects, Mistwalker improved tremendously with the last story, which featured Final Fantasy XII's cutscene director, and more importantly, Sakaguchi himself in the director's chair. That being said, I have to admit that for the most part, I really enjoyed playing this game. As someone who has lamented the changes we've seen in the Final Fantasy series since Sakaguchi left Square, I appreciated the orthodox JRPG design philosophy found in Lost Odyssey. In many ways, it feels like the natural evolution of the Final Fantasy series that could have followed Final Fantasy X and feels truer to the classic Final Fantasy formula than anything Square has produced since 2001. The fixed camera angles and map design feel very much in line with FF10. The equipment system and ability acquisition shares many similarities with FF9, and this might be viewed as a bit of a purist statement, but JRPGs just aren't the same when they don't feature an overworld map. I love overworlds. I find them to be incredibly effective abstractions that make the player feel like they're traversing an entire continent or world 
without burdening the developers with creating gigantic maps filled with repetitive content, all in the pursuit of making traversal feel less empty and boring. That's not to say that I've hated every open world game I've played, I've enjoyed quite a few of them, but it seems like developers have abandoned the overworld in favor of open world design littered with dozens and dozens of waypoints that really only feature five or six unique kinds of missions or quest types. I'm not saying that I don't want open-world-style games to exist at all. The Witcher 3 is my second favorite game of all time. What I'm saying is that in an ideal world, we could have both. Lost Odyssey's overworld map isn't perfect. You can't traverse the land on foot like in classic Final Fantasy games, but I at least appreciated that you could traverse the oceans in this way. I really miss the kind of exploration that came from gaining different vehicle types, allowing you to access different areas of the world once you unlock them. It was actually one of my favorite aspects of The Alliance Alive, and I wish more JRPGs would return to this style of map creation. In Lost Odyssey's case, you can use the smaller Nautilus to dive underwater and find treasure, but must rely on the larger white boa to break through sea ice and discover new areas. I also really enjoyed the battle system. Lost Odyssey features true turn-based combat, opting against the active time elements that most FF games included since 4, giving the player as much time as they need to input their commands without worrying about enemies attacking them. One really unique feature first introduced here is the inclusion of Guard Condition. To put it simply, Guard Condition acts as a barrier between the characters in the front and back rows of your battle formation. When the characters in the front row are at full health, the Guard Condition will be full, offering extra protection to the characters in the back row when enemies attack them. As the characters in the front row take damage, the guard condition decreases, putting your back row characters at greater risk. I also enjoyed the aim ring system, which brings a timed element to physical attacks and gives the player a chance to add additional damage or status effects when performed with correct timing. You can even swap out your rings and weapons mid-battle to take advantage of enemy weaknesses and vulnerabilities, which is awesome. The aim ring system becomes available once you've equipped a character with a ring, and the game also features a pretty robust ring crafting system where you can combine the components you pick up from defeated enemies to create new rings with different effects. There are over 200 rings that can be crafted in the game, and experimenting with them can be a lot of fun. The difficulty of the game is kept pretty consistent as well, mostly because of how leveling works. When a character is underleveled, they'll receive a lot of experience from each battle, getting them up to speed quickly. However, once the player reaches the appropriate level for an area, the amount of experience they receive decreases dramatically, which allows the developers to keep pretty tight control over the game's balance. It's pretty similar to how experience was allocated in Suikoden 1 and 2. Some people probably won't enjoy this, but I like how it essentially eliminates the need for grinding. There is still one area where you can grind a bit and overlevel your characters if you want, as long as you employ the right strategy, but for the most part, I like that this game can be played without excessive grinding. It keeps the pace moving really well. I touched on this a bit earlier, but skill acquisition is another great feature here. A lot of abilities are learned from equipment, very similar to Final Fantasy IX, which keeps most equipment relevant throughout the entire experience. In addition to this, there are unique abilities learned by the mortal characters, which can be passed on to the immortal characters through skill links. In other words, the mortal characters only learn their abilities through leveling up, but the immortal characters can learn abilities both through equipping accessories and skill linking with the mortal characters. And if this is done effectively throughout the game, the immortal characters can learn every ability there is. They won't be able to equip every ability at once since they are limited by skill slots, but with careful exploration of the game's environments, slot seeds can be used to increase the number of skill slots each immortal character has, maxing out at 30 slots total for each. I also liked how in combat the immortal characters can't really be killed. If their HP decreases to zero, they'll be knocked out for a few rounds, but if left alone long enough, they'll eventually get back up on their own. Of course, if all your characters are KO'd, you still get a game over, but this was a nice little touch and a good example of telling the story through gameplay mechanics. There's also a lot of great side quests that in traditional JRPG fashion lead to the game's most powerful abilities and equipment. Many of these are obtained by traversing intricate dungeons and defeating the game's most formidable bosses, all of which are well-designed and balanced. 
The dungeons in general are really good in Lost Odyssey, featuring some great puzzles that break the monotony of simply running forward and fighting. The environments are diverse and beautiful, and though the maps are usually designed as thin hallways, they often branch off and lead to good treasure, making exploration rewarding. It's also nice to see the inclusion of an auction house and battle arena, which were staples of classic Final Fantasy games, and give Lost Odyssey that classic FF feel. The auction house in particular is great because there's an achievement in Lost Odyssey for collecting all the treasure in the game, and if the player misses a few areas they no longer have access to, those items will appear at the auction house later in the game. The only real criticism I have of Lost Odyssey's gameplay is the fact that it's missing an escape spell. The dungeons tend to be really long in this game, and they generally don't take you back to the beginning once you've finished them. You have to trek all the way back through in order to leave, and that got pretty annoying in late-game dungeons. Shortly after Hironobu Sakaguchi left Square to form Mistwalker, Nobuo Uematsu, longtime Final Fantasy composer, also resigned from the company and went freelance. When asked what drove this decision, his answer, as always, was a bit different than you might expect. It's not exciting at all. I don't even know if you're going to be convinced with it. It's because the Square Enix office moved from Meguro to Shinjuku, and I never really liked the Shinjuku space. That commute even by car would have been an hour, and it just wasn't the right place for me. I felt whenever I stepped out of the station in the center of Shinjuku, I felt I lost direction, and it's always crowded and you can't breathe the clean air. Compared to Meguro, that wasn't the environment I wanted to be in. One alternate answer I can give is that as I moved up the ladder and it became more of a seniority thing, I got pulled into a lot of meetings during the day, and I never got to spend time focusing on concentrating on making music. So being grabbed in different directions and not being able to spend time within the company to make the music, I lost concentration. My decision was, do I want to stay at a company that's going to require a lot of non-creative time, or do I want to continue to make music? So continuing to make music is what I wanted to do and what I decided to do. After leaving Square, Uematsu formed his own production company, but has continued to contribute to several Square titles over the years. He also committed early on to compose three titles with Mistwalker, including Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey, and has retained a strong relationship with Sakaguchi ever since, remaining his go-to composer. Uematsu was particularly excited to write the music for Lost Odyssey, stating that this is the first serious RPG created by Sakaguchi after his long break. Isn't that as exciting as it sounds? Since the story was aiming for a rich, emotional experience, Uematsu wanted to record with live players as much as possible to elicit that response from the audience. Though not all the music features a live orchestra, much of it does, and a good deal of Uematsu's time was spent preparing for sessions with more than 50 players, with separate dates set up specifically for brass and strings to be put together later. Speaking on this process, he said in an interview with 1UP, there aren't many recording studios in Tokyo that are big enough to record an entire orchestra at once, so I used a few different studios in Tokyo. As is typical for Uematsu, the music of Lost Odyssey covers a range of musical styles, from orchestral to rock to electronic, but he seems to have a knack for bringing all of that together into a soundtrack that feels cohesive. It's quite difficult to describe in one word because I composed in many varieties of music for this game. I can say I succeeded in expressing myself very well in Lost Odyssey. I rarely listen to a soundtrack of my own, but I do again and again this time. Anyone who has watched my videos knows what a massive fan I am of Uematsu's work, and Lost Odyssey proves to be no different. His unique touch always ends up becoming a central part of the identity of the games he's worked on and the melancholic nature of Lost Odyssey's music blends seamlessly into the story, carrying much of the thematic weight Sakaguchi was hoping to capture. There's no doubt that the music playing in the background during the Thousand Years of Dream sequences is a massive contributor to the effectiveness of its tone, as well as its ability to tug on players' heartstrings. Uematsu even claimed in that 1UP interview that Lost Odyssey's soundtrack was his favorite among all the work he's ever done. I, for one, can attest to the soundtrack's power. Whether it be the main theme, area music, or a battle track, Uematsu pretty much nails all of it.
The fact that Lost Odyssey was an Xbox 360 exclusive meant that many longtime Final Fantasy fans never got the chance to play it, since many of them stayed faithful to the PlayStation brand. For this reason, it would probably be a stretch for most people to buy an Xbox just for a single game. But it is worth mentioning that it's backwards compatible with current Xbox hardware and can be downloaded via the Microsoft Store. It's certainly a game I would recommend for old-school Final Fantasy fans, especially those who have been disenchanted with the recent entries, since Lost Odyssey captures the spirit of classic Final Fantasy in a way that I've not seen since the release of Final Fantasy X. There's a formula here that harkens back to those golden years, and it was refreshing to play through a more modern take on an orthodox style that we don't see so often anymore. The thematic content carries a weight that inspires introspection, the prevailing tone is one that I favor for epic fantasy stories of this kind, the combat is engaging and strategic, and its structure is one that I've missed in most modern JRPGs. The Thousand Years of Dreams alone created a satisfying narrative experience for me, and while cutscene direction and the focus of the main plot failed to deliver on the incredible potential of the story's premise, the overall experience is still one that is worth playing at least once for RPG enthusiasts. If you'd like to see other retrospectives like this, I've linked two on the screen for you to check out. These take me an enormous amount of time and effort to create, so if you'd like to support the channel and make future videos possible, please check out our Patreon page as well, where we're currently voting on the next project. As always, thank you for watching, and we'll see you all again soon.